Well, good morning. Welcome to the uh, April 16th, 2019 Board of Supervisors meeting. I'm going to call the meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Good morning. Supervisor Leopold. Brand? Here. Caput? Here. Nick Ferguson? Here. And Chair Coonerty? Here, and I'll make note that Supervisor Leopold had a family obligation today, so he won't be joining us. Um, now we're gonna have a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, so I ask you to please stand. So now, uh, Mr. Palacios, are there any late additions or additions or deletions to our consent or regular agenda? Uh, there are none. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I'm gonna ask members of the board if they would have, if they have any items that they would like removed from the consent agenda and put on the regular agenda. Supervisor Caput? Uh, no, I have nothing to remove. I'll, I will just uh, have one question. And uh, we're on consent right now. Uh, well, we're, right now we're just at the question about whether you want to take something off the consent agenda. Soon will be your chance to comment. Supervisor Friend? Nothing. All right, seeing none. Um, we are now going to move into uh, the public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items that are on the consent agenda, on the regular agenda if you cannot stay, and on items that, and the um, closed session agenda, also on items that are not on our agenda today but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, you'll have three minutes. I ask people who are interested in speaking to please stand up and uh, form a line. And uh, please, sir, go ahead. Hey, hello, my name is Michael Duffy. I'm at 2613 Monterey Avenue. And I've uh, been having a problem recently the landlord uh, decided to start turning the place into a mobile home park. So there was one mobile home park there. Um, there was one mobile home, and, and the guy moved off. And as he moved off, somebody else has taken over the mobile home, and then another mobile home moved in and parked in my field. So, and then, and then uh, the, uh, the, 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 one, the guy who was staying there took off and went to Hawaii. But then another mobile home moved in, and so so he's taken over. He parked right in my field, right where I walk when I go to the quick stop, and so 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 I've got that area blocked. I've uh, <coughs> had all kinds of problems with it. You know, I had had the house uh, broken into. Have had all kinds of stuff disappearing. And, and if, I, I, if I go to the store or whatever like that, and I come back, all of a sudden I come back. And there's their stuff disappeared, their stuff from the studio disappeared, their stuff that was in front of the studio I was working on that was disappeared, their stuff in front of the house that's disappeared. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, <laughs> complete, uh, invisible man came by in my house and stole my stuff? Or is it more likely that it was the landlord thinking that he owns everything that's on the property, so he, he just go ahead and, and come and take the stuff and because it's a, you know, Whatever reason, I don't know what the, what his reasoning was. All I know is that I had stuff. He showed up. The stuff doesn't exist anymore. And when you talk, and plus before that, there was a fire in my studio <clears throat> that was uh, being watched over by the other guy. Fire in the studio. A lot of artwork is gone. So fires, everything else. I mean, as you can see, it gets kind of convoluted. You know. I know you guys used to be bitching and moaning about other stuff, but, but I mean, this is kind of, like at this point, it's kind of important. I don't, I don't know what to do. I mean, how many, do I call the cops? Do I call the sheriffs? I mean, I, I know you guys officially can't give any answers. You know, I don't want to seem like a smart ass about that, but, but, but that's the reality. I mean, but I, I would appreciate maybe if you could look it up. Like, Gave the address 2613 Monterey Avenue, SoCal, uh, California 950, 950. Uh, that's it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> I got a little bit of The mind is a 
slowly eradicating, but it is trying, trying to get a grasp on reality. Okay, well, thanks a lot for your listening to me and, and thank you, sir. Get back to me to send some the address or something. All right, thank Have you. Have a good day. Thank you, you too. Next speaker, please. Morning, uh, Tony Crane, uh, representing uh, neighborhood in Aptos, uh, with their objection to the illegal implementation of a mental health crisis facility in our neighborhood. Um, so I'm week by week kind of filling you guys in, although you've seen all this information before, um, as to the false pretenses that were created uh, to um, keep the neighborhood from having their legal right to uh, due process. So on August, on August 21st, 2017, after the program had been placed in our neighborhood, we had a meeting with uh, members of the county, um, mental health, board of supervisors, and Encompass Community Services. Uh, we were told three distinct lies at that meeting. That the grant did not mandate that it be an eight bed facility. We were told that it, licensing was not required and we were told that they had a two year extension to meet the terms of the grant. None of those were true. So here's an email that we got through public information uh, which kind of states exactly how th they were manipulating the truth. This is from Pam Rogers Wyman, who at the time was Director of Adult Services, to members of Encompass uh, following a meeting. I'm following up on questions left after the meeting yesterday. First, the question of the timeline for licensure. Again, we were told no licensing was required. We have a hard date with Chaffer regarding the date for licensure uh, of the end of December 2017. In my discussion with Eric Riera today, I advised him that we do not have enough time to get licensed. He said he had a very difficult time getting Chaffa to agree to that delay, so we don't have any wiggle room. We will need to proceed with the licensing process ASAP. We can advise Chaffa after we are underway that we are working through the process, but it will not be completed by December 17th. Here's the interesting part. I know we are losing the ability to move into the neighborhood and not alert the neighbors to the program, by moving forward with the licensing process, but we don't have a choice. That's a very specific lie that was told to us. You guys have had this information for a year and a half now, and you've chosen not to do anything about this. You've chosen to close your eyes to this. So it's complicit at this point that, that you guys just aren't listening to what was going on here and that this was illegally implemented in our neighborhood and we were lied to. So this, this needs to go away. Your, pros, your procedures are based on lies for putting, implementing this program. Thank you. Next speaker. Esteemed members of the board, thank you for your service. My name is Shalak Kavanis and I love Santa Cruz. Um, I currently have the privilege of serving as chairperson to the mental health council, um, sorry. Santa Cruz County Mental Health Advisory Board. I'm appointed by John Leopold and our board supervisor is Greg Caput who doesn't ever miss a meeting. I'm also joined by Erica Miranda Bartlett, third district. Kate Abraham, fifth district. Uh, we've currently completed the data notebook for 2018 with the help of Eric Rira, the Santa Cruz County Director of Behavioral Health. The data notebook, copies are available in the front and I have copies here. Um, uh, is a structured format for reviewing information and reporting on specific mental health services in each county. Unlike previous years that focused on specific county components or demographics, this year they requested a brief general survey about the mental health needs in the county to guide our future advocacy. I believe our survey reiterates the comprehensive health and safety goals in the County of Santa Cruz strategic plan for 2018 and 2024 as it regards to behavioral health, which states uh, supports residents and lessens community impact through increased access to integrated mental health substance use disorder and health care services. Our evaluation starts on part page nine. 
uh, needs we see on page 12, which are support ongoing staff, to, um, sorry, support ongoing training to staff, both county and community, acquisitions of facilities to develop residential programs, including for youth, and continued enhancement of IT capacity. We also highlighted the success of other programs like the integrated housing support funded by initiative, um, in, in Innovation Works, uh, the community support and uh, community services and support, prevention and early intervention, and innovation, all funded by MHSA. The Mental Health Advisory Board is also excited for the opening of the South County facility, the behavior, oh, sorry, South County Behavioral Health Facility. Finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to bring your attention to some of the presentations of our future agendas. In April, we have a presentation from the Focus Intervention Team, FIT, both from Santa Cruz County Behavioral Health and Sheriff's Office. And in May, we have Cassandra, and I'm not gonna do good with this last name, I'm very sorry, uh, is Silmi, who is the South County, uh, Santa Cruz County South County Chief of Behavioral Health Services and Community Engagement, and she'll present the Suicide Prevention Task Force Strategic Plan. And I have copies of our future agenda and the notebook, if I can turn them in. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Is that good? Awesome. Yes, can I come walk over? Again. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. Any questions? No, but oh. thank you all for your work. Thank you. I, I want to thank you also. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. okay. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrenner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos. And I want to begin today by saying what I think is going really well here in changes I see. I really like the new elevator posting signs that give people in the elevator the direction that I've seen many people um, forget from the main um, entry as you come in where different things are within the county building. And that just in this past week has been posted within the elevator so people can really figure out where they need to go, which floor they need to get off on or find their way around. So thank you. I think that's a great improvement. I also um, want to thank you for uh, removing many of the county-owned vehicles from the two-hour parking lot spaces out in the parking lot on days when um, the supervisors are meeting. That makes a big change, a positive one for those of us who have to drive in and find a place to park. And I really want to thank you for that. What I would like to ask is that um, the, the parking lot be resurfaced and restriped because there are two sets of parking delineation lines and it makes it confusing and so sometimes parking is not very efficient because people kind of get mixed up which lines to use. So I know that you've recently approved a lot of money to resurface and stripe uh, the new Sheriff's Center on Chanticleer, and I ask that you do the same for the public parking here at the county building. Um, I would like to speak to something on the consent agenda. Another piece of good news is that uh, in Supervisor Caput's area representing um, for the County Water Advisory Commission is, is Mr. Brian Lockwood from the Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency. I'm really happy to see him get appointed to that commission, so thank you. I would also like to speak to item number 43, the uh, very significant rise in expenditure for high-risk pest inspection in our county. Unfortunately, my call to Mr. Hidalgo yesterday was cut off because I didn't have enough money to continue it at the payphone, but I want to thank him for his good work in keeping pest, uh, high-risk pest areas in our county free for the agricultural. I want to just quickly um, state that um, in following up with Mr. Crane's um, comment here, your board will be considering in the PRH uh, permanent room housing overlay next week, some um, conditions that could deny certain applicants. And I feel that the Bayview Hotel was a bit singled out in that. And I want to let you know that the Housing Services Center really did a disservice to that facility. They put in people that destroyed the facility and to the point that it cannot be used and are not being responsible Thank in its um, repair. So Thank you, Becky. take that under consideration next week. Thank you very Thank much. You. 
uh, board chairman, uh, supervisors, I believe you're uh, continuing setting up a parallel government that has no response and no relationship to self-government. Uh, the appeals board has been totally abolished and you assume those positions. We heard uh, at one of the last meetings, Mr. McPherson praising all the various boards um, with banquets and everything out there doing all the politics. I don't know why you can't find a couple of uh, labor people to put the appeals board back in charge so we don't see your pockets getting fat. Uh, and we also see the Rosenberg's laws that you adopted by the political uh, union of politicians called the California League of Cities that advocates it makes it easier to tax the people out here with bonds. Also, community TV has consistently cut out presentations at this podium in San Benito and other places. And I was told by your clerk today uh, that the community TV board isn't liking both myself and other people up here. I asked her who, she says, well, them in general. I don't appreciate carrying information uh, for people trying to do free speech around here. Most people do not know that John Leopold and Zach Friend threaten the Granges here so much that they shut down two speakers. They threaten their health and their buildings. Uh, we've had the House Intelligence Committee looking for Russian collusion for two years. One of the men sitting on it, his name is Eric Swalwell. He belongs to a Yale secret society, just as the Bushes did. The, your, com your communication with the Red China and you're setting up a Soviet like AMBAG, uh, it seems to be tied into there. The head of the community TV on his bio says his closest friend is Eric Schmidt, who is renowned for censorship across the United States. Um, we've had uh, years of uh, uh, so-called collusion with Dianne Feinstein's cabbie, uh, the so-called great intelligence uh, uh, outfit, whether it was John Brennan who voted for Gus Hall and communist Angela Davis was the first choice for Obama. His second was Leon Panetta. Leon Panetta can be found uh, praising Hugh DeLacy in the, uh, in the congressional record. Uh, we find that the Venona Papers, the secret uh, communications, the espionage he was in, uh, was there. We also find that uh, uh, Leon Panetta praised Carl Hessler, who was a, uh, a communist appointed uh, uh, to run their local newspapers. Uh, the organizations, uh, the so-called uh, power group that Mr. Palacios and Mr. Ferris are running, I don't know how, how, how the CAO has time, uh, but their spokesman is men by J.R. Killigrew uh, calling for a separate breakaway uh, nation called Pacifica, just like in Reds of America, which is a book down here, John Pepper, alias Pogani, acted for a, a separate republic in the South. Earlier. Thank you very much. Next speaker. I was going to help, but I'm going to help her speak sure. first. Oh, hi. I'm Lynn Gallagher. I'm co coming here to help for some assistance with my IHSS hours. And because I don't have any family support, and because I'm just not getting enough hours. I have a lot of power equipment that I'm training everybody on, and they all come and they train after we recruit them, of course, and then um, we train, they, they don't stay. They just leave early because they get another job that pays better. And so right now, I did discuss it with my caseworker, and he did actually come in evaluate my needs, but we all know that I need more than that. And so um, to hire someone to um, cover all this power equipment that I need to use every day, it's not really the same as when somebody has a simple um, schedule like I used to have before I got worse. And now, that I um, have so much work that's needed and so much training to do, I can't keep any help and they keep on leaving me. And so it's just been chaotic for me and stressful for the past couple of years. It's not like this is new, but it's getting worse because we just keep on trying and trying to recruit new people, training them, and then um, 
it takes a lot of love and work to get them to feel confident with that um, da dangerous equipment, really it is. And so that is what I'm coming here to help um, s find some assistance from my situation. Is that my three minutes? You have one more minute left if oh. you want. And so anyway, um, do you, I just didn't know if you wanted me to list the power equipment I'm discussing or if you wanted me to submit the um, hours that we have on a morning shift every day that we're just trying to keep up with the basics. But even the basics isn't getting covered. Like for example, showers. And there's just no time, there's so much. And then, um, everyone retraining new people, it's constant. So this is what I was just wondering if there was a program that might be available for me. Thank you. Uh, I think the best thing to do would be uh, to work through your case manager and see what, uh, see what, see what's they identify as available, um, and then come back and let us know either through email or whatever's best. I've work. just done that, so they just came. Okay. They just came and evaluated me, and so we're, we're it's just not enough. Okay. It's called IHL. Oh, and then there's other programs that I don't really know much about that I've been hearing that I need to investigate as well, but my caseworker didn't know anything about them. I'm gonna have to dig them up Thank you, so yeah, so we don't really have the capability right now to, to figure out this out, but um, thank you for raising the issue and then uh, the caseworker can, can see what programs are available. Okay. Okay, caseworker, back to the caseworker. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Tina Tell, I'm a resident of Boulder Creek and um, I have a dog and there's no dog park in the North County. In fact, there's only one dog park in all of San Lorenzo Valley and it's in Scotts Valley. So sometimes I drive 25 minutes each way with my dog and to go to the dog park because I don't have a yard. And so I'm just asking if there's any way, and this is a topic that's been on your agenda for years apparently, there, to try to find a way to make a dog park in the North San Lorenzo Valley. And that's, you can, there's space available at Highland Park, there's property you can buy, there's already a sort of existing dog park at the Boulder Creek Rec facility, but you have to pay. Um, so if there's any way you could make this possible, because when I drive the 25 minutes each way to the Scotts Valley Dog Park, I meet other Boulder Creek residents who also don't have a place to exercise their dogs. And sometimes they go to their local elementary school, which they're not supposed to, but that's the only open space that they have for the dog. Um, so that's it. Please consider Dog Park in North County. Thanks. Thank you so much. So that concludes. Okay. <coughs> Marilyn Garrett, part of Wireless Radiation Alert Network. Sorry I missed your March meetings. I have a sprained ankle and I'm in a boot here. Um, but I can walk now. Um, thank you. I want to bring your attention, thanks, to um, Dr. Sharon Goldberg and her testimony in Minnesota, be, um, I'm sorry, Michigan, before the state legislature opposing the 5G technology. And she starts out, she's a medical doctor, by saying wireless radiation has serious biological effects, period. And she links these effects that are in the peer-reviewed literature and not debatable to the huge increases in diabetes, heart problems, mental health issues. And I believe you received a DVD of an event that was held here last fall uh, titled 5G Microwave Onslaught, what it means for us. Her clip, of her talk is in there, as well as promotional videos by Verizon showing how their 5G radiation penetrates buildings, goes into 
you're building whether you want it or not. I call this um, toxic trespass and it needs to stop. This is like taking over the public right of way like my supervisor, Zach Friend, promoted in the Aptos where we have th 13 of these cell towers in the public right of way, right in front of people's homes. And my radiation detector that got nothing before is now up to the top along there. This is involuntary, mandatory, toxic exposure. And like to remind you that no child, no person, has consented to this 24-7 biological harm trespass that violates our rights to health, safety, privacy. It needs to stop, and I've also given you copies of the 5G appeal to stop 5G on Earth and in space. And I, other groups have signed on to this, many scientists, because of the irreparable harm. And I urge you to do that. This needs to stop. <laughs> We're being um, irreparably harmed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This will be our final speaker. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, this is Victorious Alexander, and I want to be able to remind uh, members of the public, Santa Cruz County residents, and California residents what it is to be a good flag waving Americans because we are good people. We are, I truly believe that. America is a really good country, and I'm proud of that, being a person of color, um, uh, American-born Mexican. I want to be able to share members of the public. I've been doing my rounds, going into all, all political systems throughout the California, the great state of California, and exercising my Brown Right Act, uh, Brown Right uh, Rights. Uh, and I want to be able to encourage members of the public, and, and also the, the Madam of the Clerk, if they can do speaker cards. Because I noticed that in this county, this is the only county that allows the design talkers and the functionary bureaucrats to come and stockpile, uh, uh, you know, public comment and diminish our, our public time. Uh, having uh, speaker cards, right, and I, I go to all of them, they have speaker cards to identify for the records who's coming up here and talking. Um, I think it's very important. I want to be able to share members of the public. I, I did uh, public comment in a lot of other places, and it's really, really amazing to be able to exercise those uh, brown right, uh, right, brown, uh, brown right uh, rights. Uh, a change in language is a change in reality. And I want to be able to share members of the public. I was able to Google uh, uh, Zach Friend's uh, uh, information regarding uh, Transparency California, because I wanted to see how much uh, 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 Zach Friend is making. And, I, and I'm going to say this, I was shocked. They're not making, you guys are not making a lot of money. And it, it grieves me. Um, but I, I noticed that, uh, I guess your name, I apologize, uh, Zach Friend. I, I didn't realize that your name is Zachariah, and I apologize. I thought it was Zach, and so I misspelled it. And Carlos Palacio, if I'm, I'm saying your name incorrectly, I apologize. Uh, I, I, you know, I believe that, you know, Carlos Palacio. But I want to be able to say this, it's very important, and I want to be able to talk to the Jewish political aristocracy in this county, just like in Santa Clara County, because we're having a problem, you know? And I want to be able to share with members of the public my latest book that I'm reading, Why Be Jewish? And I want to be able to talk to uh, Rabbi uh, Shefford and Rabbi Marcus, because I attend Torah study. And I want to be able to, to talk to MZ, Political dissent is very important, right? Being able to uh, enjoy the ethics of political self-expression is important. Coming in here and pushing up on the control system with moral force and gumbo diplomacy to demand regime change at some institutions that are not accountable to the American public. The abolishment of self-government is, is real. You know, when I come in here, I don't need to be vulgarized. This is lawful activity, from Madam of the Clerk to the security to Zach Friend. Dude, stop trying to vulgarize my, my activism, man. I'm not going to, I'm not. So that was two minutes. That was three minutes. It, it, okay. Thank you. Well, all right.
Thank you. Uh, so that concludes public comment. Uh, we'll now move on to action on the consent agenda items. These are items 13 through 46. They'll be taken in one motion, and now I'll see if any members of the board wanna, wanna speak to any of the items. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I wanted to comment on a couple that, um, on number 19, Assembly Bill, uh, 18, or 1783 by Assemblymember Robert Rivas. It's uh, an important step in supporting affordable housing for our farm workers in, in our region. Uh, item number 20, uh, the homelessness system performance measures. I wanna thank the CAO and the staff who's been working with the city for months now to sell, uh, set up some shelter sites throughout uh, the county. I support, the, I support the shelter expansion uh, throughout the area t to serve the homeless in our community. I wanna thank especially the Salvation Army for st stepping up <coughs> and really helping us out in this regard this year. Uh, but I do uh, continue to be concerned about the Ross camp and the health and safety risks at uh, that camp. And I wanna thank the uh, Health Services Agency of the county and, and their empl its employees who are reducing the harm there. Um, it's become somewhat of a serious situation and we need to, uh, to continue to address that and, and hopefully we can come to a, a good solution with the city. Um, on items number 25 and six, I, I think it's uh, from, from Supervisor Coonerty to, um, to support the state's proposal for whole person care funding uh, statewide and a public guardian and public conservative program statewide. Uh, these are very, very important um, issues that we need to address, and I, I hope that the state can, can help us out in that regard uh, for these most vulnerable <coughs> populations. And uh, just to say, I really welcome uh, number item 31, the appointment of Jenny Gomez to the county's Fish and Wildlife Commission. I know she's gonna be doing a great job. She has great uh, expertise in the GPS systems, and her work here at the county has served on the Environmental Committee of the San Lorenzo Valley County Water District. Uh, she'll be a great asset to serving us in the county. Thank you. Great, Supervisor Caput. Sure, real quick, uh, thank you. On uh, item 20, uh, it's good to see we have money appropriated for the uh, Salvation Army to continue the emergency shelter at the VFW. Uh, the, the only one question I do have is that uh, on the River Street uh, relocation, uh, it says here on April uh, 17th, money allocated from April 17th, and uh, we're not up and ready yet, so my question is, uh, the money that we would be spending, uh, if it's not, op if the relocation's not open, where does it go? Uh, yes, uh, Supervisor Caput, this is the second amendment to this contract with Salvation Army. Um, the first part of the amendment funds the VFW shelter on 7th Avenue uh, through June 30th, and that will that is proceeding, that part sure. of the contract is. The River Street um, sheltering operations uh, have not been opened by the city, and we're not sure what, um, what time frame they're gonna, they're gonna be on for that shelter service. So that money will just stay with the county then. We just, won't, uh, we just won't pay it out until they actually open it. So it'll stay in the county uh, and our staff will be monitoring the contract. And if it is opened at some point, then that's when we will pay it I'll out. I'll pull it out. Thank you very much. And then item 27, I wanna welcome uh, Jenny Sarmiento to the uh, Women's Commission for District 4. Also, Antonio Rivas uh, for the Mental Health Advisory Board. Uh, he'll be a, a great addition for that. Uh, item 29, Brian Lockwood as the Water Advisory Commission appointee. Uh, he'll be a big, great asset also. And Diane uh, Munoz uh, for the first five commission for District 4. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so just a br few brief comments. The first is uh, on item 20, echoing Supervisor McPherson's comments. Um, I'm glad that we're moving this forward. We need expanded shelter options for uh, those who are homeless in this community, the VFW, uh, and hopefully at 1220 River Street. Um, the Ross Camp continues to be a public health and public safety disaster. Um, I'm hoping the city will uh, follow uh, what was agreed to back in February to close that camp and open up the, uh, a camp at 1220 that would be managed um, and safer uh, for both those in the camp as well as those as well as the community adjacent community and the neighbors. Um, 
So I look forward to continuing to work with the city uh, on this issue um, and hope that they will decide to move forward um, on 1220 um, and then sh uh, close the Ross camp. Uh, finally, uh, on items number 26 and number 41, I wanna appreciate um, the Health Services Agency for expanding uh, public guardians uh, in our community. We're seeing a, a dramatic and increased demand uh, for these services and we need to be able to respond to make sure that people are able to uh, stay safe uh, and by hopefully getting some state dollars and pulling down some federal dollars and hiring these additional positions, I'm hoping um, we can increase the services we provide for people who are very much in need uh, of a public guardian. Um, of public guardian services. So uh, with that, I will uh, look for a uh, motion. Second. Motion by McPherson, second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes four to zero. Um, we're now moving on to uh, item number seven, which is a really uh, always a fun and exciting uh, time of year where we get to recognize uh, members of the community who participated in the volunteer initiative program and the sheriff's volunteer program. Uh, and I'm going to uh, ask Carlos Palacios to make some introductory remar remarks. Uh, yes. Uh Thank you, Chair Coonerty and members of the board. The Volunteer Initiative Program is a partnership between the Volunteer Center of Santa Cruz and the county, matching interested community members with volunteer opportunities throughout county government. The county is extremely fortunate to have such a dedicated group of volunteers supporting our efforts. We are help, happy to welcome Volunteer Executive Director Karen Delaney and Sheriff Jim Hart, both of whom will be making brief remarks and presenting certificates of appreciation. Also with us today are Donna Patters, the VIP Program Coordinator, Margaret Ingram, the Parks, volunteer, Parks Department Volunteer Coordinator, and Amy Jerome, the Animal Services Volunteer Coordinator. Now I'd like to turn over the presentation to Karen and Sheriff Hart to make their remarks. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, Chair Coonerty and members of the board, we are delighted. This is our second week of volunteer, National Volunteer Week celebration. Um, more than ever, I think it is really important for the community to take time and uh, in the current time where we see so much erosion and contention of our civil space, uh, where it's really easy by a push of a button to say things that are critical, to find the things that we want to call out. And free speech is an important American right. Um, it's equally important, maybe even more important, to talk about the great American tradition of expressing your love for democracy, expressing your love for the community by actually going out and using your time and talents to fix things today. I have a quote on my office for the wall for the last 35 years from Anne Frank, how wonderful it is that no one need wait a single moment to make the world better. So today we get to take this precious public space and talk about what is working, talk about how people are making this community better. Um, and the interesting thing about the response to our current times is people who volunteer are stepping up even more. They're not taking more time to talk about things, they're taking more time to do things. We know this because every two years there's a study of volunteerism, and for the 35th year in a row, the amount of time that volunteers donate has gone up. We see this locally too. So we're gonna hear some really great stories of local heroes here, and they deserve our thanks. We know they're stepping up. What I'd like to say on behalf of the family of the Volunteer Center is, for the rest of us, are we really doing our part? Because that civil space, that ability to step forward and fix a problem today is probably the strongest thing in a community. And are when, at a time when it's so easy to express our words, are those of us in leadership really doing everything we can to make sure that the people who are quietly working today to make things better are getting an equal shake? Not one week out of the year or one day out of the year. 
Are we telling their stories in our newspapers? Are we telling their stories on our websites, in our blogs? Are we making sure that we seek them out every time? You guys are great writers. You guys are out in the community, the department heads. Are we seeking them out every day and making them feel welcome and saying, we see the work you're doing? Because invitations are important. Telling stories is how we do recruitment. And I think this is something without question we all value. We are all grateful, but kind of like your mom or other things that are so fundamental to our lives, perhaps we, need, we could do a little bit more to make these quiet backbone heroes of our county, of our community, feel welcome and thanked every day and everywhere we go tell people that just like they have a constitutional right to come here and say what's on their mind about their community, they also have an invitation to step up and help us solve the problems and do the real work. So um, with that, I think, Sheriff Hart? Not here yet. Not here yet. Okay. <laughs> with that, perhaps we can start with um, the volunteer recognition. So Karen, just, uh, and before we do that, if someone's watching at home or they're sitting in the audience and they're thinking, wow, I'd like to volunteer more, how could they do, what's the best way for them to do that? In the Santa best County? way for them to do that is to go to our website, scvolunteernow.org, or call any one of our offices. We have about 350 volunteer opportunities, including here at, this, at the County of Santa Cruz. You can search them online. Um, you can call any one of our centers or any one of our program offices. We, we're like the Amazon for people who wanna do good. We aggregate um, the volunteer needs of about 350 local uh, nonprofits, faith-based organizations, government organizations, and schools. And 15,000 volunteers in our community last year through the Volunteer Center. That's, that's higher even than during the earthquake. People are stepping up because they love this community and solutions are everywhere when we take the time to look for them and recognize, recognize them. Thank you, thank you. So yeah, why don't we start uh, recognizing some of the remarkable people in our audience today? This is not, oh, I'd like to. Well, this isn't a time for public comment, so right now we're going to be recognizing volunteers. Agenda number seven. Yeah. Oh, I'm shorter. Good morning. My name is Donna Patters, and I am the Volunteer Initiative Program Coordinator here at the county. First, let me say I love my job. I get to help people who want to help people, and it's, it's fantastic. So, Karen, thank you for giving me my job. <laughs> It's an honor to be a part of this amazing group of people that we will be recognizing today. And as a volunteer initiative program coordinator, I work one-on-one -on -one with many of these volunteers, placing them in opportunities within the county where their talents will benefit our community. Before we start our official program, I would like to take a moment to mention a few of the volunteers honored, but who unfortunately were not able to be with us today. Carrie Boss, Animal Services. Carl Silverberg and Sadie Spaulding, County Parks. Jordan Rich, Probation. Patricia Medina, Sheriff's Office. Thank you for your volunteer service to our community. The volunteers that we will honor today will be provide, they, are, they provide new ideas and different ways of working and thinking to make our community safer, healthier, happier, and stronger. As we recognize our award recipients this morning, I will read the name of the honoree who will then come forward and join me at the podium after which, a member of the board will give us a brief overview of the honoree's volunteer service. Our first honoree is Gary Watson. Supervisor Friend will be reading the remarks. Thank you, Donna. Gary Gary's been involved with the County Emergency Operations Center, or EOC. He's worked on creating a new database for security badge ID program and learning the new badge machine and creating templates for the EOC badges. In the year that Gary's been volunteering with the EOC, he has logged over six hundred volunteer hours. Gary's participated in three major training exercises that tested our interoperable communication capabilities and resulted in addressing gaps and vulnerabilities to improve EOC operations. His willingness to seek out and learn new skills both in online training offering and in-person offerings is a testament to his commitment to work. Please join me in congratulating Gary Watson. I 
think parking may be a little issue out there. <laughs> it's a little challenging. <laughs> um, well, hopefully our next honoree is here. Our next honoree is Kathy Cummings. Supervisor Coonerty will read the remarks. Sure, Kathy's been volunteering for eight months with the medical therapy unit in public health and has given 225 hours of her time. Catherine, uh, contrib uh, Kathy contributed enormously to the MTU program in many ways, going beyond the basic duties. She has served our program both before and after her former UCSC internship, giving her substantial time and quality work to special projects. Kathy is an intelligent, well-rounded, and creative person with strong analytical skills, and we thank her for her volunteer service. So thank you. Thank you so much. Our next honoree is Michelle Hoffman. Supervisor Caput will read the remarks. Michelle has been a part of the animal services family for almost six years, giving over 1,000 hours of her time. Uh, she is a dedicated volunteer who works primarily with our Watsonville shelter location and is a medical foster parent Michelle has greatly impacted the success of several of our shelter dogs by providing a foster home for dogs with medical needs. Michelle is also a mentor with our dog TLC program for new volunteers. Her support of the shelter, and that's specifically the Watsonville location, has been tremendous. Thank you. Our next honoree is Sandra Herrera. Supervisor McPherson will read the remarks. Thank you. Sandra has been volunteering with the, the probation department for the past 10 months. She has been instrumental in assisting this department in preparation of their triannual California Law Enforcement te Telecommunications Systems Audit. Sandra is well-rounded and, and a balanced volunteer who is committed to her work with the probation department. I want to thank Sandra for her duties. I hope not everybody's having problems parking. <laughs> Maybe so if they do come later, though, we would like to have them step up and be recognized as well. Absolutely. You've got the no show. Okay. <laughs> Where are we? I lost my space. Oh, Paul. No, Lane. Thank you. Um, our next honoree is Lane Maloney. Supervisor Friend will read the remarks. Lane is an incredible dedicated volunteer who has been with the shelter for almost eight years and has filled a variety of roles while volunteering for over 7,000 hours, which if you were to factor that out, that's about three and a half years of full-time uh, volunteer work. It's pretty remarkable. She trains and mentors new volunteers to work with the rabbits and also assists all of the shelter departments. She helps stay on top of the laundry, which can be a huge undertaking most days when caring for a shelter full of animals. She assists with showering cats and rabbits to prospective adopters, is a trainer for new volunteers and cat and rabbit programs, and helps with chicken adoptions from the barn and assists with many off-site community events. Congratulations, Lane. She's prob probably volunteering, though. Yeah. <laughs> right, I mean. Our next uh, honoree is Paul Lockwood. Supervisor Coonerty will read the remarks. Sure. Paul's been volunteering with Animal Services for five years. He's a cat whisperer uh, in the truest sense. Paul is a trainer for new cat volunteers, guiding them through the nuances of shelter cat, the shelter cat program. He comes to the shelter several times a week to interact with cats, show cats to potential adopters, answer questions, and provide education and information. However, his best skills are interacting with the shelter's shy or fearful cats. He has spent many hours playing, coaxing, and connecting to kittens and cats that are afraid and just don't like people too much i.e. all cats. Um, <clears throat> he magically turns them into purring, affectional love bugs. Thank you, Paul. Our next honoree is Chris Marsh. Uh, Supervisor McPherson will read the remarks. Chris Marsh. Thank you. Chris is a versatile volunteer who jumped in with both feet when he started the shelter at the shelter in 2017. Chris exercises some of our bigger, rowdier dogs and helps dogs who are fearful of men learn that they might not be so scary after all. 
Chris can often be found passing out peanut butter treats while he helps staff tuck the dogs in for the night. In addition to working with the dogs, he also helps out with some maintenance projects on the shelter grounds, including spreading mulch and wood chips around the barn area, and was instrumental in getting the grounds ready for the shelter's 10th year anniversary in 2018. Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Okay, and Lane too. Would Lane Maloney please come up to the podium and Gary Watson? We read your remarks, but we'd like to recognize you. I know that you're here now. <laughs> We're gonna um, let Sheriff Hart come up and make a few comments now and uh, honor the sheriff's volunteers. And hopefully that will give us a little more time for folks to come. Jim Hart, Sheriff Coroner. It's a pleasure to be here this morning, and I am really proud of our volunteer program and the work that, that our volunteers do for our office. They, they do everything from citizen patrol to manning our substations. We have people volunteering in our missing persons uh, section as well as our coroner section and throughout the office, and, and they provide a lot of great resources that we would otherwise uh, not have, and so it's a great program. We, we were able to, to bring on Claudia uh, Padilla from uh, to be the program coordinator for our volunteer program. She's done a wonderful job getting our numbers. I think we have well over 120 volunteers in the sheriff's office now. And so it's, it's, a, it's been a great partnership. We started this in about 1996 and we've kept it going now for the last 23 years and, and it's a very valuable program to the, to the office as well as to the county. So thank you very much. Our next honoree is Robin Gabriel. Supervisor Friend will read the remarks. Robin is a relatively new volunteer, but has made her presence known since she started with the animal shelter. She is a tier two dog walker, meaning she spends time with the shelter's dogs that have not been fully evaluated and are not yet adoptable. Robin comes in for a regular shift, but also helps cover for others when needed, and she's on the barn team and comes in to clean and feed our barn residents. She assists with promotional spots for the shelter at KPIG Radio, on their Pet of the Week segment. Robin is an excellent public speaker and a true advocate of the shelter and all of its programs. Congratulations, Robin. Our next honoree is Leslie Andrews. Supervisor Coonerty will read the remarks. Great. Is Leslie here? There she is. Uh, so, Leslie is a longtime animal shelter volunteer. She's logged over seven years in the volunteer, uh, volunteer time and invested over 1,700 volunteer hours in this program. Leslie is a liaison with, the, with Rabbit Haven Rescue, one of the shelter's placement partners, coordinating, coordinating transport of rabbits to show for potential adoption, as well as transport uh, to other placement partners. She also assists the staff and the rabbit team with foster placement of rabbits. In addition, Leslie leads the rabbit and cat photography team. Uh, she helps set up their glamour shots, showcasing these animals visually, which helps aid them in the adoption process. Hi, and thank you, Leslie. Thank so this uh, next one is, I, I just wanna say before we start that this, these young men are amazing. And I'm, I'm very honored to have the opportunity to say that our next honoree is a representative. His name is William Rosenberg, and he's representing Tau Kappa Epsilon Fraternity from UCSC. Uh, Supervisor Caput will read the remarks. All right. The fraternity came to the County Parks Department looking for a project to complete for a community service project. 
The fraternity has now adopted Scott Creek. These young men came out to Scott Creek Beach on an average of two weekends a month to shovel and wheel, wheelbarrow sand out of the beach across the area that people of all abilities can enjoy the viewing platform. They also spend time cleaning trash off the beach, removing invasive ice plant and performing graffiti abatement on the posts and curbs along the highway. It is so admirable that a group of college students are willing to commit to such a physically hard and challenging project on a continuing basis. That's a lot of work, and uh, we, we, we all appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those slugs. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> Our next honoree is Tim Lowe. It's a, actually, it's a team. It's Tim Lowe and Bruce Maddox. Um, and they're a volunteer team from the Sheriff's Office. Supervisor Friend will read the remarks. Tim and Bruce regularly work together and serve as Sheriff's civilian volunteer drivers. They've also been valuable participants and volunteers in the child safety program. Volunteering twice a week, they're positive representatives of the Sheriff's Office in the community and work well with both parents and kids. Thank you both for all of your contributions. Our next honoree is, where are we? Oh, Brittany Moots. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Supervisor Coonerty will read the remarks. Sure. Brittany volunteers in the Forensic Services Department for the Sheriff's Office. In just over a year, Brittany has given 227 hours of her time. She's very organized, reliable, and kind. In a sometimes hectic environment, Brittany remains cheerful and passionate about volunteering. She is an excellent volunteer and a valuable resource for the Forensic Lab. Please join me in thanking Brittany. Our next honoree is Jerry Rappaport. Supervisor Caput will read the remarks. <coughs> Jerry has been a part of the volunteer team at the Aptos Service Center as a civilian patrol driver for the Sheriff's Office for 15 years and has given over 5,000 hours of his time. In addition to his volunteer duties, he has developed training materials and route maps for new volunteer drivers. He is always helpful and willing to train new volunteers and is a great addition to the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office. Thank you very much. Be before we move on to our final honoree, I understand that some of the animal <coughs> services volunteers have are, made it here. <laughs> Come on up for a photo shoot. Shot. <coughs> and you, Michelle, Michelle and, Paul. and Paul. Thank you all very much. Our final honoree is uh, Danielle Aparicio. Uh, Supervisor McPherson will read the remarks. Danielle is a volunteer at the coroner's office in the sheriff's office, or the, the coroner's division of the sheriff's office, excuse me. Uh, in the seven months she has been volunteering, she has given 159 hours of her time. She's a great help to the department and is an extremely fast learner. In addition to regular autopsy tasks, Danielle has assisted with specimen and evidence rotation and destruction. This is an extremely detailed task that Danielle has tackled with a smile on her face. She is committed to serving the Sheriff's Office and her work is much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. 
This concludes the formal presentation of awards. We would now like to invite you all to join us for a reception in the hallway where we would be serving light refreshments. If the awardee, award, awardees would please uh, gather just to the right of the doors over here. We'd like to do some more photos because you're very, you know, photogenic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Again, this has been a wonderful experience and I look forward to the next year. So, thank you. Thank you. So, on, uh, and Mr. Arnold, this is a this is a presentation, so there's no public comment because there's no board action. So, um, so I'm going to ask you not I to. Need a call from council on that. It's a regular agenda. On the consent calendar, you've got 13 to 46 things. We sure. Have slid so, Mr. Arnold, Mr. Mr. Arnold, we've already so spoken. Uh, you already had your chance to speak to those items. This is a public presentation. No, there's no. Communication. Oral communications and consent agenda. Is the county council going with, the, with, with that decision or are you going with the county council, please? Mr. Arnold, it's my decision and I'm going to give you, uh, this is your first warning to sit down. Thank you very much. So I want to thank all the volunteers, ask that you uh, step outside, enjoy the refreshments. I can see the UCSC students have already headed towards them. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, and thank you for so much for your service and to the team that organizes this. We're going to keep going because we're on a little bit of a tight schedule, um, but uh, please know that how much you're appreciated and where, how grateful we are for your service to our county in our community. Uh, so now we're going to move on to item number eight. This is a public hearing to consider a resolution and ordinance amending county code chapters 1310, 1320, the local coastal program implementing ordinances to create the seascape beach estates SBE combining zone district with a zone plan administration adding 152 parcels to the district, minor variations to the PUD uh, use permit 4119-U and CEQA notice of exemption and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. That's okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Coonerty, Supervisors. Uh, the purpose of today's public hearing is to consider proposed amendments to county code to create the Seascape Beach, uh, uh, Seascape Beach Estates Combining Zone District. This proposed zone district would introduce site standards specific to the Seascape Beach Estates neighborhood. This is a project with a lot of history. Uh, I will provide a brief overview of that background and will then present the proposed site standards with reasoning for each standard. Uh, a lot of public comments have been received. Uh, your packet does contain uh, public comments received since your last public hearing on this project, was, which was in March of 2017. Um, so the Seascape Beach Estates Combining Zone District geographic area consists of 152 parcels along the Aptos coast. These parcels were originally mapped as four separate tracts called units in the Aptos Seascape Estates subdivision between 1968 and 1972, as demonstrated on this map. Uh, all of the lots in this neighborhood are zoned for single family development. Uh, the neighborhood is unique in its location and topography. As you can see from this photo, the natural bluff was graded into terraces that step up from the beach, with lots configured such that each property has a sight line to the ocean. Portions of the neighborhood were later designated as part of a visual resource area uh, in the county's general plan and local coastal program. Uh, development in resource, uh, visual resource areas must preserve public vistas. Okay, the neighborhood uh, was built out soon after being subdivided according to the county's development standards at the time as well as the conditions, covenants, and restrictions or CCNRs recorded by the developer for each of the subdivision's units. Adherence to the CCNRs during build out has created a unique design character with defining features that can be seen throughout the neighborhood, including a distinct uniformity in structure height and rear yard uh, limits of development, homes that are close together, and noticeably low profiles of most homes when viewed from the street. However, this existing uh, development pattern is not reflected in the single family zone uh, site standards in the county code. This difference between the CCNRs and uh, the county code has resulted in many existing homes in the neighborhood being considered non-conforming structures um, and has also led to inconsistency in terms of what standards are assessed uh, when reviewing proposed development projects in this neighborhood over time. Uh, so the purpose of the Seascape Beach Estates Combining Zone District is to codify the characteristics of the existing built environment, propose the exist, uh, preserve the existing neighborhood character, protect public views from the beach, and provide clarity regarding development in this neighborhood going forward. This photo provides an example of the unique character of the neighborhood as seen on Via Gaviata. 
The homes on the beach side are clearly single story compared to the taller homes on the inland side of that street. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Um, okay, the uh, combining zone district standards would be applied to the 152 parcels as an overlay to the single family residential development standards. Special site standards uh, for the combining zone district would include structure height, setbacks, floor area ratio or FAR, and lot coverage. All other use and development standards uh, in the R16 and RB zone districts uh, would continue to apply to these lots. Um, so uh, here's a timeline of the, the most recent work on this project. Uh, there have been multiple attempts to codify unique site standards for this neighborhood over time. Most recently in March 2017, staff presented your board with one proposal from uh, Unit 1, another proposal from Units 2, 4, and 14, also known as the Seascape Beach Estates Community Coalition, um, as well as a compromised staff proposal for site standards. The board accepted staff's uh, proposal and concept and directed staff to move forward uh, with a, uh, drafting an ordinance uh, with lowering the, uh, but lowering the maximum height limits on certain properties. Uh, following that board meeting, staff conducted a survey of existing building heights in the neighborhood. And then on May uh, 22, 2018, staff held a community meeting to convey those results and gather feedback uh, on the draft standards. Staff has continued to communicate uh, with the Seascape residents over time and has uh, refined the draft standards in, attempt, in an attempt to best meet the objectives of this zone district. Uh, so in February, the Planning Commission uh, reviewed the draft standards and recommended approval with additional direction to staff to clarify non-conforming uh, regulations uh, as well as measurement of structure height on upslope lots uh, and measurement of rear yard setbacks and providing clarity on the measurement of side yard setbacks for non-rectilinear lots. So um, uh, in response to Planning Commission direction, uh, staff has spent substantial time uh, looking at a variety of options. Uh, today we are presenting recommendations for measurement of structure height and rear yard setback, but note that there are a variety of options that are also presented in the staff report that the board may wish to consider. Um, throughout the ordinance, but especially in the case of structure height measurement, there are benefits and drawbacks to every alternative, and staff has attempted to balance these with the interests and priorities of all parties involved. Uh, for instance, some measurement strategies may be simpler to administer, but may result in creating uh, new non-conformities. Okay. Um, so uh, this is just a, a table for reference. Um, the proposed site standards before you uh, incorporate many of the standards in the CCNRs and reflect board direction, planning commission direction, as, and property owner input. This table presents the proposed site standards um, on the right. Uh, compared to the existing site standards in the R16 and RB zone districts. Okay, so now I'll discuss each of the standards. Uh, maximum structure heights proposed in the SBE combining zone district are 16, 18, and 28 feet, depending on the location of each lot within the neighborhood. These are the same structure heights that were recommended by the board in 2017. Uh, maximum structure heights of 16 or 18 feet are proposed for lots along the neighborhood's lower terraces in units one and four. The CCNRs for both of these units already limit structure height to 16 feet on most lots. As a result, most existing homes on these lots uh, were designed as 16 foot height um, single story homes as viewed from the street. Uh, there was public comment and discussion at the Planning Commission hearing expressing concern that the 18-foot height limit is not appropriate on Via Malibu and Via Campania because it does not match uh, the 16-foot height limit in the CCNRs um, uh, as well as existing conditions. Um, okay, so in terms of measuring structure height, the ordinance proposes that structure height in the district be measured from street elevation rather than from ground level of the structure itself, which is the usual county measurement. Um, this alternative measurement methodology, um, which was in the proposal that was presented to the board in 2017, uh, is a reliable way to preserve continuous uniform roof heights uh, that parallel the coastal terraces um, stepping up from the beach, which is an important aspect of the visual character of the neighborhood. Um, also, this height uh, methodology is already included in the current Unit 1 CCNRs. Um, unfortunately, the measurement methodology does have a con, which is structures on properties with ground that slopes up from the curb uh, may now be counted as non-conforming uh, under the proposed measurement methodology, um, even though they would be conforming under the standard county code measurement. Um, 
in Seascape Beach Estates, most properties have at least a small front yard upslope um, uh, from the curb to the building pad just to account for drainage. Um, the height survey results further highlight the issue with measuring structure height from top of curb. Um, survey staff measured height from the top of curb to the top of structures on each lot, and the results indicate that this measurement methodology would cause approximately half of the neighborhood's existing homes to be non-conforming structures in terms of height, um, as indicated in this table. It's initially surprising that so many homes would be non-conforming uh, with the new height limits in a neighborhood where CCNR has already constrained building height to 16 feet on most lots. However, the height survey results uh, show that most lots that would be newly non-conforming would only be non-conforming by one or two feet. Um, so it's likely that most of these uh, structures would conform to the maximum height limits when measured from the building pad level. Um, I'm happy to discuss that further. Um, so given this issue, uh, Planning Commission directed staff to assess alternative measurement options for upsloping lots. So staff considered a variety of options and ultimately is recommending that any elevation gain from the curb to the front property line, which is the front of the building pad, not be included in height measurement. What this means is that if a lot um, has an upslope from the curb to the front property line, structure height is simply measured from the pr front property line elevation. Um, the photo on the right illustrates what we're talking about. Um, so this is a lot on Via Palo Alto in Unit 4. There's a small upslope from the curb to the front setback line where the building pad begins. Um, this upslope would not be included in the measurement of the building's height. Um, and then this uh, modified measurement methodology does better reflect existing uh, conditions and therefore the number of non-conforming structures in terms of height would be reduced. Um, there still uh, are a small number of hillside lots in the neighborhood that would still be non-conforming in terms of height, even with this modified uh, methodology. So for these lots, such as the one shown in the picture here, um, property owners would be subject to the county code requirements related to non-conforming structures uh, if they wish to rebuild to that existing height. Um, okay. All right, so now I'm going to show a couple of diagrams that illustrate what we're talking about a little bit more clearly. So first we'll look at a typical seascape lot and then we'll look at a hillside lot. So here again is 948 via Palo Alto, which is a typical lot in the neighborhood. It has a small upslope to the building pad and a downslope on the rear of the parcel. On the left is a photo of the front of the house and on the right is a section drawing uh, showing how homes like this are situated on lots. Um, so in this, um, uh, for this lot, the CCNR's limit structure height to 16 feet. Um, the CCNR, um, and the CCNR's uh, state that height is measured from ground level. The height survey revealed that this home is 17 feet as measured from the curb, which means that the top one foot of the structure um, would be non-conforming in terms of height under our draft ordinance. Um, the red dot indicates the reference point for that height measurement. Um, so alternatively, um, by using the proposed modified height measurement to take into account the elevation gain from the curb to the front setback line, the structure would now be conforming with the 16 foot height requirement. Okay, and then the second example we have is this is uh, 745 via Gaviata in unit one. So for this unit, the CCNRs stipulate that height is measured from the curb, but this home was built um, before the current CCNRs were in place. Um, the proposed height limit on this lot is 28 feet. As measured from the curb, a, long, a large portion of the structure is non-conforming. In fact, the structure me measures 47 feet from the top of uh, curb to the top of the structure. Um, but when you measure from the front setback line, the height of the structure is still non-conforming. Um, the property owner would need to follow the non-conforming structure process to rebuild a home to this height or to build an addition that would further increase the non-conformity. Um, However, discretionary review um, might, may be appropriate on a, a highly visible site such as this. Um, the property owner could rebuild um, up to 65% of the major structural elements under our non-conforming code um, without going through a discretionary review, however. Okay, and then one other point I wanted to make regarding height. Um, with the adjustment of measuring height from the front setback line, homes along Via Malibu and Via Campania will be able to build even taller um, because they will have two different allowances for height in the code, a height limit of 18 feet rather than 16 feet, plus an allowance for elevation gain on these properties um, from the curb to the front setback line means that um, uh, height as measured from the curb to the top of structure could be 20 feet or more on some properties, um, which is taller than most structures today. 
Um, so this is uh, just a diagram illustrating that concept. Um, this is along via Malibu. The height survey for this home determined that the home's about 17 feet tall, measured from the curb. So it does already conform to a height limit of 18 feet. Um, now with the proposed measurement um, from the front setback line, the property owner would be able to build taller. Um, for this reason, if the um, board decides to proceed with the staff recommendation uh, for um, uh, height measurement, it may be appropriate for the board to consider reducing the height from 18 to 16 feet on Via Campania and Via Malibu. Um, with the allowance for the elevation gain from curb to building pad, it's likely that most properties on those streets would be conforming with the, the recommended um, uh, measurement methodology. Okay, and then I'll briefly touch on setbacks and FAR and lot coverage. Um, so in terms of setbacks, the proposed front yard setback is 20 feet. Um, this is the same as the setback already, already required in the R16 zone and would not create any new nonconformity. Uh, the proposed side yard setback is 10% of lot width, which is similar to but not quite the same as county code and also would not create any new nonconformities. Um, at the Planning Commission hearing, there was a question about how side yard setbacks are measured on non-rectilinear lots, such as flag lots or pie-shaped lots. Um, this is explained in the staff report. The same rules apply countywide for those types of lots. Um, the staff recommendation for measurement for rear yard setback has changed since the Planning Commission hearing. The previous staff rec recommendation had been an averaging of the rear extent of homes on adjacent lots. This works well for some parts of the neighborhood, um, but does not work well on cul-de-sacs and hillside lots um, where the rear extent of neighboring homes varies. Uh, so for this reason, we are now recommending that the combining zone district simply codify what's in the CCNRs for these lots, um, which is quite detailed, um, and that the rear yard setback should be 15 feet, which is the usual county uh, code standard for this, for this uh, single family zone district um, on any lots that don't have a CCNR requirement for rear yard setback. So this um, closely matches uh, what exists on site. Um, okay, and then in terms of FAR and lot coverage, um, the proposed district includes a more generous FAR and lot coverage standard than um, is allowed by the underlying single family zone districts with the intent to um, achieve, achieve a balance between limiting structure heights and providing flexibility for residential development. Um, most homes in the neighborhood are non-conforming with county code in terms of FAR and lot coverage because they were built to 60% FAR per the CCNRs. Uh, these two aerial photos show examples along Via Concha and Via Campania. So the proposed uh, FAR and lot coverage would provide an opportunity for most of these properties to be conforming, um, and in some cases would allow for small additions within the constraints of height and setback uh, limits. Uh, the Coastal Commission initially had expressed some concerns with uh, the potential for increased mass and volume as a result of these FAR and lot coverage standards. Um, but after further discussion with staff, Coastal, the Coastal Commission has uh, recently submitted a letter of support, which should be in the late correspondence for this item. Um, and however, note, note that per county code section 1320, projects on properties in this neighborhood do require coastal, a coastal development permit in any case uh, if they are increasing building height or floor area by more than 10%. Um, so staff recommends that the board review uh, uh, these items, open a public hearing, uh, affirm that the proposed amendments are exempt from CEQA, and adopt in concept the resolution, ordinances, and minor variation. Uh, after the Board of Supervisors approves the district, staff will pose, uh, post the CEQA notice of exemption, and the final step in the process uh, will be a public hearing at the Coastal Commission. Thank you. Thank you. So first I'm gonna ask if there's any questions from board members. Uh, Supervisor Front. I have a couple of brief questions before I definitely want to hear from the community on this. Uh, you had mentioned on the six, on the 18 and 16 foot on Malibu and Campania, Unit 4 just had a CCNR vote, correct, to re-up their CCNRs for the next 50 years that set that back to 16, or it didn't set back, but continued the 16 feet, correct? That's correct. So in essence, you've got a, a neighborhood there or a unit specifically asking us to maintain a limit. Uh, at 16 feet and not actually go up to the, okay. Yeah, specifically for, for Via Malibu, okay. which is in Unit 4. We've received a lot of uh, correspondence on that. Great, um, I do have a couple other questions. On the, on the non-conforming, I mean, look, my entire district is non-conforming, the entire county is non-conforming. If we're honest with each other about things, I mean, it, in fact, most things are unpermitted, but, but more specifically, I don't have the same concern on non-conformance that I recognize um, 
in an elegant world, in a simplistic world, everything would be conforming, but we don't live in that reality in Santa Cruz County. Is there a way, though, uh, in a nonconformance, specifically when you're creating a new zone district, to actually lower the level of review of if it fits within? So we're, we're setting a, an established parameter that then creates new nonconformance, although ostensibly on there are things with 40 feet that are in nonconformance or 28 foot limits outside of the scope anyway. Is there a way to, to lower that from say a, a five to a four or something as part of these actions? Um, potentially. Um, yeah. If it was specified within the overlay district, you could modify the other section of the code that speaks to nonconforming. I mean, I recognize that there's a concern from community members about nonconformance, and I think it actually comes from a lack of, of knowledge about what that really means. Um, as I said, I mean, we're all basically nonconforming living in this county anyway, sort of <laughs> in general, not just in our homes. But with that said, I think that there is a, uh, a concern that was expressed both on the lower uh, units that were concerned about whether they'd be able to rebuild. I think that's been clearly addressed through the Planning Commission language. They wanted us to restate that language today. I think that's an easy thing to do. But if uh, I'm trying to, to determine what, in essence, would be a compelling public interest to a higher level of review, if the board has already made a statement that the, it has to fit within these parameters anyway, and you have CCNRs that are also saying it has to fit within these parameters anyway, um, because I would just assume a higher level of review would just be sort of more cost or time associated with the homeowner coming in on a rebuild. Um, okay. So if there isn't a compelling public interest associated with that, I think I'd like to explore the possibility of a, of a lower level of review to kind of address that. Sure, yeah. Seems like a doable thing. Yeah, that could be done. Uh, regarding the, the upslope I recognize creates some, some challenges on the measurements. It's a very unique topography. It's a beautiful area. It's a, it's, it's a remarkable area. I think that there's been an, an overarching interest both from the Coastal Commission on the first letters they sent back when the Millers had submitted their uh, proposal for a remodel to now. They, they just don't want anything to be bigger. They don't, want, they don't want taller buildings. They are supportive of what we're doing now because it's A, it actually simplifies the process, B, it provides clarity to the, the neighborhood. Right now the neighborhood does not have any clarity of what would be approved either by the board or by uh, the Coastal Commission. But what I want to be sure of, of is that there isn't a capability if you did something different on uh, the upslope properties that there would be a capability in essence of, of a little bit of gamemanship to go above on some of these components. I recognize that you do need a permit for fill in theory, uh, but as evidenced by the fact that when you go through the survey, it's not, a, it's not an official survey, but you go through those height surveys that we did, basically uh, very few people fit under the current CCNR requirements now. You've got 16.2 feet, 17.1 feet, so it just makes me recognize that this is an imperfect situation. So I don't want to create something new by doing an upslope measurement that would actually allow for additional feet to be gained uh, for something other than an emergency basis. So if you were just to remodel it, we don't have an interest in that. If, if your house falls down, we want you to be able to build back as built. Right. And how do you allow for that criteria, not maybe a kid inheriting a property and saying, I want to go up two, three, four feet because I now can under this structure. So how would you respond to avoiding that component? Well, as part of our existing non-conforming ordinance, you may rebuild in the event of any kind of catastrophe, you could rebuild exactly what you had previously and we've restated that in the draft ordinance. Right. Um, we could put some parameters around uh, rebuilding um, and adding a, a foot or two with a, a, you know an exception process or something something like that that's a little bit I'm, I'm not advocating for that what I what I what I'm asking I'm sorry that I, I apologize I didn't, probably didn't ask a very clear question but I don't think that anybody in the board or community cares about somebody being able to rebuild a non-conforming structure to its current height in that area period mm -hmm. uh, and there's been concerns in that neighborhood about whether this action would prevent preclude somebody from doing that I think that we're taking that off the table. I think the concern is, would the board be creating an action by which somebody could be able to go up, not just on an emergency basis on a rebuild, but just somebody buys the house and they wanna go up because they're now on an upsloping property and based on our new measurements, in theory, as you noted on some of your drawings, you could. Mm -hmm. Either by increasing the fill, and so you do it sort of on a backdoor way, or just directly. That's not, I don't think that would be the intention of the board to allow any sort of uh, height component. So I, I just mm -hmm. wanted to know how we would address that. If we're not doing a top of curve me measurement, how would we address that specific concern? Yeah, so actually one thing I, I didn't mention in my remarks, but we did get um, 
some public comment and concern about what if uh, someone were to add fill and increase the height of their their grade, and then they could feasibly, you know, if you're measuring from that point, have a taller house with a better sight line to the ocean. Um, so we actually did uh, provide a memo uh, uh, for the board um, proposing to add, if, if you want to go with this measurement from the front setback line, proposing to um, add language that it would be uh, measured from existing or finished grade, whichever is lower. And that's actually how our height is measured in the county anyway, uh, our usual height measurement. We always go from existing or finished, whichever is lower. So even if you didn't add fill, there are some properties that based on, uh, even if I were to go from 18 to 16 or the board were to go from 18 to 16, there would still be some properties on the upslope that in theory could go up even without the addition of fill under this structure, correct? If we approved what's being recommended. Yes. So how do we prevent that using an as-built language would be my question. And so I'm not putting this onus on the county. I mean, to me, you have to, as a homeowner, would have to show that your property was X. You would have to have a survey done pre-disaster that would show it. This isn't, shouldn't be a county responsibility. But I think that there is a compelling interest here, and the Coastal Commission has also expressed this, to not have those properties just go up. Mm -hmm. And so how would we ensure that uh, moving forward with doing an upslope measurement that's different from the top curb? Well, we, we don't have anything in the draft ordinance to address that other than the proposal for measuring from existing or finished grade, whichever is lower. Um, if you look at the uh, topographic contours for the neighborhood, the vast majority of the lots, and I believe I have a table in the staff report also indicating this, um, the vast majority of the lots are between, have between zero and two feet elevation gain from the curb to the front setback line. Um, so when we're talking about being able to build taller, it's, it's n not a lot of additional feet that we're talking about. Also, um, most homes in this neighborhood were built um, based on a height standard measured from the ground adjacent to the home. So that's why so many of these homes would be considered non-conforming with the draft ordinance as measured from the curb. Um, the Unit 1 CCNRs, current CCNRs measure from the curb, but those those CNCNRs were modified to add that provision in 2001. Most of these homes were already built. Um, so what the, the height measurement from the front setback line does is it um, does a little bit of a um, more accurate job at, at uh, um, matching the existing conditions. But it does allow for some properties to build higher, one to two feet. So, um, and just to, to add to that, um, Many of the applications that would come in would be, they'd be subject to coastal zone permits anyway. And coastal zone permits are level five permits by definition. Oh, fair enough. So we don't have a lot of room on the level that we process this. Okay, I, I, appreciate, I, I appreciate that. Uh, but I still, this still goes back to um, how do we maintain it as built as opposed to allowing it to go up? If what we're doing is changing that understanding, that, that would be a concern I would have specifically that, that some of these would increase height. The very most conservative way, I think, to deal with that would be to measure the height relative to the street, but um, to take that measurement at the highest point on the street itself and not at the front yard setback. So at the top of curb? At the top of curb. So it just means that we have more non-conforming structures? Yes, who have the process that they have to go through because of that. And again, that, I mean, that doesn't particularly concern me if it means that somebody's allowed to, um, I mean, there's going to be a whole host of other concerns coming down. They live in a coastal zone. Coastal Commission is making changes, wants us to change things on LCP and rebuilds. I get all that. But with that said, I want to ensure that people can rebuild. I just want to ensure that people can't rebuild uh, based on actions that we're taking particularly higher because that's, that's, I think that's been, Coastal Commission's made it very clear that they wouldn't support that in the first place. That's, that's why we're here in large part. We're here to create something that provides clarity that everybody knows that they can come through and get a permit from us, get it through Coastal and be done, and it doesn't change the overall character of the neighborhood. Um, it's a significant amount of work to get there, but I think that top of curb may be the better solution to that than as a result, uh, even though I think it makes for a slightly uh, more complex component of the end user. Open up. Okay. So let's uh, now open it up for public comment. Uh, those who wish to speak, I ask you to please uh, line up if you can, uh, and we'll give everyone two minutes um, to, to submit their comments.
Good morning, Dan Orlando from 930 via Tornasol. I'm also one of the uh, ARC members in Unit 4. Uh, we would like the board to know, as uh, uh, Mr. Friend pointed out, that uh, we had our vote and 98% uh, uh, were in favor of extending our CCNRs for an additional 60 years and 20 years uh, thereafter. The hyper via Malibu remained at 16 feet. <clears throat> It would be very confusing for our unit four owners to now be given an 18 foot height. So we respectfully request that you be consistent with our CCNRs. Uh, top of curb is not perfect, but it's the best approximation of what the original developers attempted to do. We know unit one explicitly added this measurement to its CCNRs in, two, in the 2000, early 2000s, and our unit four uh, will be using top of curb for all height measurements uh, in the future, as it's the best, best method for moving forward to support Unit 1 in the use of this measurement. Introducing a completely new measurement such as height at the front setback line adds a new element of confusion and will, redu and will reduce clarity. We are trying to eliminate any and all confusion. In fact, when we renewed our CCNRs, we removed the ability of the ARC to make an exception to the 16-foot height limit. Clarity is crucial. I would also like to point out that any existing heights above 16 feet on Via Palo Alto south of Clubhouse or Via Malibu are due to construction errors. A home would not be permitted to be built any higher at any height over 16 feet. I suspect, suspect this is true in Unit 1 as well. The fact that Via Campania and possibly Via Malibu is treated differently than the other 16-foot streets could create animosity and confusion. You know, I'd like to, uh, okay, that was it. I was gonna thank uh, Paya and uh, Daisy for all the help they've done on this. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Hal Garish. I'm also a, uh, with Dan, a member of the ARC uh, in Unit 4. And uh, at the risk of being redundant here, uh, I thought it was important to just to uh, reinforce the enthusiasm that our neighborhood seems to have. We started this on May 20th, the, the, the votes went out, the proxies. Uh, 22 days later, which is last Thursday, we received uh, 40 ballots, legitimate ballots, 39 of those equally distributed between Via Palo Alto, Via Malibu, and Via Tornasol were practically unanimous in favor of this. So. We were, were very excited about that, uh, something we actually couldn't predict in advance. Um, I guess I wanted to also mention the process we used was uh, we, as Dan mentioned, we did extend them not only uh, for 60 years with 20 year automatic re recurls, but we, we eliminated the, we prohibit the ARC now from making any exceptions to that. We're very keen on the height thing, and it's as illustrated by the, the feedback from the uh, owners. We hired an independent organization, Access Association, to manage the process for us. We had an inspector of elections who presented and opened the ballots for us, uh, uh, did a nice job doing that, and we're just uh, very hopeful that based on the speed with which our, our owners responded, and the enthusiasm that they, they showed as we talked to each of them in this process uh, kind of reinforces the idea that we're really very interested in making sure that the combining district, in fact, can reflect our CCNRs because it's a, uh, it's a very clear statement to us that uh, there's a preference for owners at all levels there to do that. So thanks very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you. Hello. Um, I've met many of you on uh, different occasions and I've been very impressed with our county supervisors and our county board of supervisors. So um, I want to say that um, it would be important for me that the county align their uh, zoning with what our CCNRs say. Um, I'm in unit four and, um, and my name's Al Petricelli. I don't think I introduced myself. and. Um, Guess I'm a little nervous up here. And I wanna thank Daisy for the hard work that she did. And I think that, you know, I guess I'm naive, but I would like not to find my property as I bought it 25 years ago to be non-conforming when I've lived there all that time. And any little things that I did, I went through the planning process and got a permit. 
um, to suddenly be non-conforming just doesn't sit right with me. Um, so I think that um, uh, Daisy's proposal to measure the height from the front of where the house was built is a better process. Um, yes, it can be gamed, but it should be obvious when somebody's gaming it. Um, and uh, we have lots of photos. We've got lots of measurements. We, we sort of know where the front of the property line is and we can do that before they pull the permit. Um, so I, I think that that would make my house no longer be non-conforming, which is important to me, but I think it also would take down the percentage of homes in the neighborhood that are non-conforming. And so I, I um, agree with what Daisy's proposal is, that we should measure from the front of the property line, and that's how it was built. And the topography of the street, which is flattened out, is different than the three-dimensional topography of the lots as it goes down. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Hopefully I won't take two minutes. Uh, Tom Suchvitz, 1058 via Malibu um, in Aptos, and I'm in the Unit 4 area. Uh, all my neighbors, uh, and as uh, Hal indicated, we've all voted to extend our CCNRs. Again, removing uh, any exception uh, beyond the 16-foot level. Uh, so most of the homes tried to comply with that when they were being built. Uh, again, as uh, they indicated, it may be an inch or two different, but when those homes were all built and the setbacks were all set, they were all in compliance. And so if any person purchased the property or uh, passed on to family in different generations, the proposal of keeping it at the existing height levels would keep us in the compliance, even though we're not technically, uh, by your views, in compliance. Our, our properties are in compliance, in our view, when those homes were being built. Uh, and the measurement standards have changed from that standpoint. So uh, again, I would recommend that we review again to make sure that we can only replace as originally sat on the property. Very similar to what uh, Mr. Friend was uh, uh, stating is that replacements cannot go higher than what they existing. Thank you. Thank you. This be our final speaker. Is there anyone else who would like to speak with us today? Okay, this will be our final speaker. Okay, um, hi, first of all, I'd like to thank Daisy and Paya. They've stood with us for the last, what, two, three, four, five years, and to thank your board for coming up with the idea of a combining district so we get this resolved once and for all. I'm gonna try and make it quick. I'm sorry I'd timed this for three minutes, not two, but I think I'm the last speaker, so hopefully we're okay. Um, Supervisor Caput, you'd refer to this as Camelot the last time we met, and I'm just reminding everybody we wanna preserve and protect, so thank you, Supervisor Friend, for saying we don't wanna go higher. What I'm concerned about is if we do go from measuring at the front setback instead of at the street, oops, um, that they will go higher. That's what the pink's trying to show. Um, our measurements using the GIS web are that the average property would go up 2.3 feet. Most of them would go up one to two. Quite a few of them would go up five or six feet. So we would encourage Supervisor Friend to do what you said. We don't want them to go higher. We just want them to stay the way they are. Um, these two charts, which I sent out to you guys, and I'm not gonna bore you with it. The big thing here is that most of the homes are gabled. They're peaked. And so if you take a home that's say 17 foot one, that means the eaves are around 13 or 14 feet. If you raise the height to 17, the edges will fill in. And you're gonna end up with houses that look like this guy on the top, where is it opposed to just keeping that little tiny T piece up, if you raise the height to 17, the entire house can get bigger. So it sounds, oh, it's only going up a foot or two, it doesn't matter. Gentlemen, every inch does matter, and if we don't want to increase the bulk, please leave them the way they are. And we have it right now, there's a wonderful process in the existing county code that says you can rebuild up to either 60 or 65% without it. So that's my big speech. And then um, there's one other speaker behind me, I think that's gonna talk about a licensed surveyor. Uh, we've all talked about the reason the homes don't comply by a foot or two is because of construction errors. And currently the building department says that if you're building reasonably close to the maximum, there's an informal process where they have a licensed surveyor come in and measure the height. We'd like to ask you to codify that and to put that into the ordinance that says you do need to have a licensed surveyor. So if you're off by an inch or two or three or a foot or two, it doesn't have height creep. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, this will be our final speaker. Yeah, I'll just say, I won't speak because she just said what I was gonna say, which okay. is the inclusion of the informal rule that planning currently uses. So, thanks. All right, thank you. All right, so that closes public comment and I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and discussion. Supervisor Friend. So I have a question to address Dr. Petrocelli's concern regarding uh, nonconformance. If it's true that you need a level five permit because they're in the coastal zone anyway, explain to me then what the fundamental difference to the end user would be if they're in conformance or not in conformance. Um, the coastal permit is required if they're um, increasing height by more than 10% or floor area by more than 10%. And, and there's some other parameters as well that would throw you into needing a, a coastal permit. Um, so walk me through again what the difference would fundamentally be between somebody who's experiencing, I, I mean, I, I don't know his home specifically, but based on your current chart, a lot of these homes are not in conformance already even before we take the action. So this puts more homes in, but I, I think that it's important for unit four, unit one to recognize you're not, you're non-conforming now. So tell me then what would fundamentally change then for somebody uh, that's coming in trying to rebuild. So yeah, so the chart, the height survey results, that's, that's for if, um, if we adopted this ordinance with these, these height standards. But it's true that we have sta standards outside of this. We have 28 foot height limits within the county writ large, correct? So it, if you're a 40 foot house, irrespective of where it's measured or a 33, you're out, you're already non-conforming. That's right. on the Gaviota side. But I right. mean, there's a number of homes that are, I'm saying are non-conforming with standards before we even establish this. So I'm not, I, I don't understand the compelling public interest to care about theoretically, quote unquote, adding more homes into non-conformance if it meets the overall compelling interest that the units are trying to seek, which is a specific height limit. I mean, mm -hmm. to me, that's the, over, that's the compelling public interest, right? Overall, that we're trying, and this is what the Coastal Commission has also stated, they don't want things to go up. So, well, the trade-off for that is that you're gonna have more non-conforming homes. I mean, that's, so that it, it doesn't sort of, you don't really get both ways, but I just w didn't know what the fundamental end change would be. If I had a home that was conforming versus non-conforming within the coastal zone, is it a significantly more expensive process or more, because I feel like the board's gonna put in a set of explanations and standards that'll still provide clarity for when you come in to get that permit. For any home that would not otherwise, for any change that would not otherwise require a coastal permit, the process is um, a level four process. Okay. Um, I think the difference is that there are some additional findings that have to do with neighborhood compatibility um, and noticing, so that is more process. Um, one of the, I think the key is what you said, which is that it's a matter of trade-offs. Um, one of the goals was to have um, a more straightforward, more process, more clear rules, uh, so less, there would be less issues bubbling up through the process that created headaches in the community. Um, so there may be a little more potential for that. On the other hand, um, it sounds like part of the experience of being non-conforming is the feeling like you built to a certain standard and you should have sort of that entitlement going forward. Right. But really the nature of non-conforming is that that's what happens as the code changes. So legitimately built properties go into non-conformity all of the time for lots of different reasons. And so could that not be solved in part by if it doesn't trigger a CDP that you would just do it at a level four, we would specify that within the SPE? That's actually how it's specified in the non-conforming section of the code now. It's a level four process. Yeah, Which doesn't require the noticing and the, other, the findings, correct? It or does, does require the noticing, it doesn't require public hearing. Okay, and it's not appealable, other than theoretically through coastal, if it. A, a level four is, is appealable to the next level. Okay, what would, be the abil what would be the justification for appeal if it falls within the guidelines that we're establishing today though? Meaning it matches the CCNRs, it matches what we say, so why am I allowing somebody to appeal that? Well, it, it, you're, allowed, you're allowed to appeal. There's not a first finding. You, there aren't certain bases on which you can appeal. So somebody could appeal and then it would come out through the appeal hearing whether there was that there's no basis, basis for, for that. Right. Okay. Um, if I could clarify one question. Um, if you don't need a coastal development permit, then it would not be appealable to the Coastal Commission, if Correct. that's the concern, so it would that's only be- That's not my concern, no, I'm just trying to, okay. I'm just trying to address a concern that I think is more about um, a sense of feeling about fear of nonconformity than the reality of what it actually means. I mean, the reality is, as I said, we're basically already all nonconforming. This is the reality of going through the county planning process in general. So, I'm okay. sure those others may have questions or comments. Does anyone else have any questions? 
Okay. No, I, I, um, I just want to congratulate people for working this out. It seems the more complicated than uh, I thought it was uh, when I first started reviewing this, but uh, I just want to congratulate you. It seems like we're, we're doing something that's going to be on the same page that people can understand and uh, won't have to, in essence, tear down their home because it's non-conforming or something. So I appreciate the work that's been going in, gone into this. Sure. S Supervisor Caput. Right, uh, a little more on the history of it. Uh, I know it's, it goes back, I believe, to 1968. <clears throat> the, uh, that was before the Coastal Commission was uh, formed, is, is that correct? How many years before? Just a few years before. Yeah, just but a couple. Yeah, we would, the current coastal rules would certainly not have allowed, it, allowed that terracing of the coastal bluff. Sure, okay. so uh, under the conditions now, the, it would probably never have been built. Uh, so what we're doing now is uh, kind of just making sure it stays close to what it is today. Is that my, that's Correct. the understanding I get. Correct. That's the goal. Okay. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I just have one final question, which is in regards to that license surveyor comment that was made. I mean, I'm not, um, it's the first I've heard of it, and I don't feel prepared to have knowledge about it. So, is that, would that be something that would you'd be supportive of, concerns with, or? Um, st staff feels like we have a robust process for measuring height and and making okay. sure that plans and buildings are in conformance with the plans. The building inspectors do that routinely. Okay. Um, well, with remarkable gratitude to Ms. Allen, Ms. Levine, and Ms. Miller for your work over what seems like. Um, uh, 88,000 dog years on this project. <laughs> but at least but at least we're doing it, right? I mean, this has been an issue for a long time and it hasn't been addressed by previous boards and I think it says a lot about uh, this staff and my colleagues that they were willing to do it. So with that, I'd, I'd like to move the staff recommendations with the, fi with the following uh, clarification and modifications. The clarification is just reiterating the rebuild language that's already within the Planning Commission, but just to make that very specific. Uh, to modify the 18 feet to 16 feet on Malibu and Campania. And to do uh, top of curb as the measurement. Okay, so we have a motion by a friend, a second by. Well, I, have a, a I think there's clarification. Question. A clarifying so, question. Um, what it, what um, modification were you requesting to the non-conforming um, text that was added by the planning commission? Oh, just I was reiterating the rebuild language. But yeah, I was just what's, in, what's yeah, already in there? That's correct. Oh, okay. Got just it. Just reiterating. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so is everyone clear on the motion? Great. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes four to zero. And thank you to the staff for their work. Okay, we're now moving on to a schedule item, 1045 schedule item, which is item number 11, to uh, consider alternatives evaluated by the Santa Cruz Coastal Reuse Plan, Davenport Cement Plant. Uh, prefer, select a preferred alternative, direct staff to seek funding to complete the required environmental review of the proposed local, local coastal program amendments to implement the selected preferred alternative, and to direct staff to revise the permitting process selection based on Coastal Commission comments as outlined in the memorandum of the CA, Office of the CAO. Uh, we have Andy Constable here uh, from the Economic Development Department to uh, briefly uh, present this item. This is an item that had Pre been previously brought to the board, delayed to allow for more community uh, input, and is being brought back today for consideration. Good morning, Chair Coonerty and uh, board members. Uh, I'm Andy Constable, is uh, uh, the Economic Development Manager for the County of Santa Cruz. Um, I'm returning today uh, at your direction from the February 26th board meeting where I did the presentation and received public comment on the Santa Cruz Coastal Reuse Plan, Davenport Cement Plan. At the close of the presentation, the board deferred the selection of the preferred alternative to today's board meeting. With that in mind, I'd like to refresh your memory of the coastal reuse plan, the economically feasible alternatives provided therein, and the future steps forward. So originally, the purpose of the plan was to identify three financially feasible land use options, alternatives, I should say, to stimulate the redevelopment of the closed CMEX cement plant in Davenport. Let me pull these up, there we go. Uh, the, the team that was assembled for this effort consisted of the RRM Design Group, which helped with land use, EPS, or Economic and Planning Systems, Inc., which was 
uh, helped with the financial, excuse me, yes, the economic feasibility, and the Wood Group, which was for econ, excuse me, environmental services, county staff, coastal commission staff, and community input, including the grant funders. I got ahead of myself, sorry. There we go. Funding for this project was provided by the Simpervirons Fund, the State Coastal Conservancy, uh, Resources Legacy Fund, and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. There we go. So today I'll be taking you through a review of the reuse plan or process uh, and the timeline that was necessary to do that. And what we've completed to date, reviewing the various alternatives that include the staff's recommendation of a preferred alternative and providing you with a revision to the follow-up permitting section within the plan that was recommended by the local Coastal Commission staff. Before we get started, this just for reference, this is an aerial uh, view of the site of the Davenport cement plant. There we go. And as this slide indicates, uh, the plan process or timeline began in fall of 2016 and has progressed over the past two and a half years to today's board meeting. Within that time period, we've conducted several stakeholder meetings, three community workshops, numerous meetings with local Coastal Commission staff, produced a draft technical background report, the draft reuse alternatives, a draft coastal reuse plan, and revised the coastal reuse plan, which was presented to your board on February 26th, and is being reviewed here today. As I indicated, the original plan was to produce three economically feasible reuse alternatives. However, after significant public input and interest from a local clean technology company, two additional alternatives were brought forward, which are represented here, and rather than get into the detail here, I will as we move forward. Things quick, there we go. Before I do though, as far as identifying it, all of the uses that are within the uh, alternative uses do contain these particular uses which were, I think, integral to the process. They, can, they exist as a visitor center museum, I'm sorry, exist. They include a visitor center museum, restrooms and parking, public trailheads to provide access to National Monument and San Vicente Redwoods, camping and or cabins, emergency service storage, and staging, agriculture, and open space. Okay. There we go. The first alternative is a eco-lodging and visitor serving use. It's similar to the Costa Noa Lodge that's in the uh, north coast also. It's approximately 100 rooms, 75 cabins, 25 tent cabins, 100 campsites, a spa, approximately 15,000 square foot of event retreat space, a uh, restaurant and family employee housing of about 30 units. Alternative two, which is the largest of the five uses, uh, is similar to a Silomar, which is in Pacific Grove. Uh, it's about 200 rooms, 75 cabins, a spa, 25 tent cabins, 75 campsites, 30,000 square feet of conference center, um, recreational activities similar to all of the alternatives, a restaurant and a family uh, employee housing of about 50 units. Alternative three is a age-restricted housing and visitor serving use. It's about 100 rooms, 100 cabins, 50 campsites, a spa, and then the age-restricted housing, which is about 300 units, uh, family employee housing of about 30 units, and about 226,000 square feet of light industrial artist maker space. Alternative four was a clean technology and visitor serving. Um, this use was under consideration as a result of interest from a local business entrepreneur, but was removed when the company, which is Joby Aviation, determined to have more immediate needs. The alternative use consisted of these uses, the clean technology, the visitor center, some employee housing of about 50 units, artist studios, some cabins, and a restaurant. And lastly, there was alternative five. What this slide represents was what we did to modify alternative one, which was a de-scoping, to bring it into alliance with what the community had indicated as being desirable. So it was significant reduction in rooms, cabins, campsites, uh, and, uh, affordable housing. We did add, however, about 20 market rate units in order to make it financially feasible. There still is a small event space of about 2,000 square feet. I'm going to switch to that slide. Sorry. 
Brittany, which ended up with about 75 total lodge rooms, 55 cabins, 25 tent cabins, 39 campsites, the 60 affordable housing and 20 market rate housing, and about 225,000 square feet of flexible space. And then lastly, a market rate, excuse me, a, a neighborhood market, a restaurant, and a small wedding venue. So as you consider the various alternatives, uh, I believe it's important to highlight that this is not a project. Uh, this is simply a process that we're trying to bring forward that's really a planning process. It's lengthy in its nature, and it's basically a pathway to the future development of the site. And while the reuse plan will help facilitate reinvestment and redevelopment, any future proposal will require review and approval of development permits by the county and coastal commission and allow additional opportunities for community input. With that in mind, this last slide represents a very high level upcoming steps to the process, and these steps include and are not limited to the selection of a preferred alternative by your board, identifying funding for environmental review. I think it's important here to, to notice the fact that we don't have a path forward for environmental review because we do not have the funding as yet. Once we do, an EIR would be necessary, followed by county review of the various committees that are identified here, lastly ending with Coastal Commission review and approval. So finally, at the request of the local Coastal Commission staff and with the approval of the County Planning Director, we recommend the revision and follow-up permitting process in the future steps and implementation section on page 9.3 of the reuse plan to include the following text, which I'll read into the record. After final approval of the plan, future development will be required to undergo the discretionary permit process that will include the preparation of a planned unit development, which will require a separate local coastal program amendment pursuant to county code section 18.10.184, as allowed under the visitor accommodation zoning district and coastal development permit that is appealable to the coastal commission because the project is located within a sensitive coastal resources area as defined in county code section 13.20.040. And that concludes my review of the reuse plan and the alternatives. If you've got any questions, I'm happy to help. Thank you. I guess I'll ask if anyone has any questions at this moment. Um, briefly, I just want to, uh, again, uh, remind members of the community who may be uh, just starting engaging or have been for several years really uh, actively and contribu contributing to this process. Um, the point of this is this site is one of the uh, most unique sites on the coast of California. It's also one of the most challenging sites on the coast of California and maybe uh, anywhere. Uh, it is, uh, and the purpose of this was to take this grant funding and begin a conversation with the community, with the Coastal Commission, with the county as a whole, as to what could happen at this site. Um, we still would have um, years of studies and process ahead of us uh, if and when we get a project, but the purpose of this was to really look at what's the regulatory environment, what's the economic environment, and then what are the what's the community want in terms of benefits, uh, and then try to come up with a plan for what this might look like. But again, we don't have a project in front of us uh, um, and even if we did, we would still have uh, many, many opportunities uh, for public input, for analysis of water and sewer and traffic uh, and all the various things, uh, various elements that, that happen with any project, um, and, then, and then a project would be brought forward. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna ask uh, members of the community if they would like to come speak uh, on this, about this item. I'm no, uh, the <laughs> I have a pretty big voice, but not <laughs> big enough. Um, I'm Noel Bach, 30-year resident of Davenport and um, on the DNCA, Davenport North Coast Association. And we thank Supervisor Coonerty and his staff for your commitment to considering the options of the community of Davenport on the cement plant reuse. Um, everybody in Davenport that I've spoken to about the alternatives are united in one opinion, and that is the proposed scale would completely overwhelm uh, the community. We have about 100 existing homes, and we could absorb about 30% more housing units, but not 
uh, 80 more housing units. Pacific School could possibly take on about five, 50 more Davenport students by replacing the Santa Cruz transfer students, but we couldn't take more than that. There's simply not enough playground space or parking. Over the years, with a population of 400 in Davenport, the balance was established with a cement plant employing about 125 workers. However, it would be completely out of scale if visitors, hotel employees, flex space employees tripled the daily population as outlined in some of the alternatives in, in, in Alternative 5. The RRM consultants correctly state that Davenport's primary economic asset is quality of place, created by exceptional coastal environment, local recreational opportunities, and, a quaint, and quaint roadside businesses. However, this quality of place could easily be wiped out if the scale of new visitors, employees, inhabitants inundate the environment, thereby destroying the very attractions that draw people to the North Coast in the first place. So I urge you to recommend a more balanced cement reuse plan which preserves the environment and cultural integrity of the North Coast. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Good morning, my name is John Barnes. I'm a board member of the Davenport North Coast Association. I uh, have been on the board for 25 years. I also was um, in charge of fiscal and environmental planning at UCSC for 17 years and oversaw two long-range development plans for the main campus as well as the coastal science campus, which is in the coastal zone. In looking at the reuse report and um, and the process, we did not get a clear information on the population the Semex redevelopment would attract. Davenport is a small town, as Noel has pointed out, and the alternatives all included some pretty intensive development, but no way of understanding the population breakdown. Population drives environmental impacts and the ways they are mitigated. And then in many other ways that are not regulated by CEQA, population also affects the very nature of Davenport. So we put together a best guess analysis ourselves of the population that would be on the site at peak summer times. And that's included as an attachment with our letter from the Davenport uh, from DNCA. That an analysis is based on, or the visitor serving uh, element of that analysis is based on Costa Noa in the same way that the report, some of the assumptions in terms of the kind of visitor serving uses uh, on the site uh, was also, uh, uh, Costa Noa was used as a model in the report. The calculation was purposely conservative, but it does project a very large spike in the number of people who would be living in Davenport and on Semex of up to 1,300 people, which then when you add that to uh, 400 is uh, quite, a, quite a spike in the number of people that would be uh, in the town of Davenport at peak times. Um, when I was at UCSC during the last LRDP, and Ryan will remember this, um, the campus was accused of being the 800-pound gorilla sitting on the city of Santa Cruz. And I um, urged the board to consider the fact that this project may have the same um, kind of reputation for Davenport. And let me just close also by thanking uh, Ryan and his staff for um, meeting with us as, as often as necessary and also working with the community and all of, all of the um, work that you and your staff have done on this complex project. And we look forward to continuing that relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mark Lipson. I'm a resident of Davenport since 1983 and member of Molina Creek Farming Collective, uh, producing organic vegetables on the North Coast there since then. Uh, and I am a member of the Davenport North Coast Association board. I just want to comment very briefly on the reuse planning process. I was trained at UCSC in environmental planning many years ago, and 
you know, I don't feel like the state of the art has proceeded very far. This process has been conspicuously lacking in terms of integration of cumulative impacts and dis just sheer discussion of the number of things that are happening on the North Coast, major significant land use changes, the rail trail, national monument designation, San Vicente Redwoods, all of these things are combining to, uh, you know, this slow motion tsunami that's approaching Davenport. Not so slow motion as it gets closer. Um, so I really feel like the process is failing the community in that respect in integrating the discussion planning about all of these events that are uh, occurring on the North Coast in the planning sphere. Uh, I also just need to note that I, I just think it's fallacious to say that Alternative 5 reflects the desires of the community or that the, the process has effectively tried to elicit that. I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't want anybody to take that personally. I think it's a function of just the difficulty of the process. But, uh, you know, it's, it's been crammed together and the consultant checked the boxes in terms of uh, community meetings and sticky dots on the butcher paper, but that's only a first order uh, approximation and I really feel like our community deserves a better effort by the community or by the county and uh, its instruments, its planning instruments to have a more integrated process and a, a deeper look at how we're developing the whole North Coast area. And finally, I just need to say that agriculture is getting very short shrift in, in the process. Uh, there's a, just a very sort of one dimensional look sense of agriculture as Brussels sprouts on, on the north coast and we, we could have a lot more imaginative approach to the future of agriculture in, in this planning process. Thank you. Good morning supervisors and staff. Um, thank you Ryan Coonerty. Um, my name is Jessica Wolf and I'm a seven year resident on the North Coast in Davenport and a member of the Davenport North Coast Association Board and a lifelong resident of Santa Cruz County. And today I would just like to sort of reiterate what Noel has said about scale. And um, I do believe that the, the scale of this final um, uh, option or preferred option is is going to be overwhelming for Davenport. But also I would like to um, speak to this as part of the county. Um, I care a great deal about the vitality of our community and our, um, not just the community of Davenport, but how it rests within the county. And I see us not um, on the Davenport North Coast Association Board as trying to hold back change, keep the community exactly the way it's always been. Um, in fact, in many ways, it's much better than it ever has been. Um, we don't have a large industrial presence anymore. There's vast potential for the Semex site to be a gateway for visitors that really makes sense, that integrates all the different access points from Rail Trail and Chidoni Coast Dairies to San Vicente Redwoods. Um, we're excited about the visitor serving possibilities and we would like to see um, future planning and if at all possible this plan take more into account of how those different various actors on the North Coast, all the different planning processes interface, create cumula cumulative impacts and um, how those impacts can be mitigated. And so I would just say, um, that would be what I would request. Um, and I would also just like to say that as far as the basics of the alternative five, um, a lot of it sounds great and will be potentially very beneficial to Davenport as a community. And we, we just hope that the overall 
vitality of the community, the character of the community can be preserved, and the environment's carrying capacity, the capacity of the roadways, um, our emergency services in the, on the North Coast, et cetera, can also be sustained at a reasonable level and we don't just create hazards and attractive nuisances and problems. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any other speakers? Anyone who would like to speak, please line up uh, and we'll come, then come forward. Uh, good morning, uh, my name is Joe Ben Bevert. I'm the CEO of Joe B Aviation, uh, 45 year lifelong resident of the North Coast. And uh, I care very deeply about the North Coast and, and uh, trying to uh, continue to have it be a, a spectacular place to, to live. Um, I also have dreams of having my uh, my company uh, based at the cement plant and I've been working with uh, Semex in the community for many years uh, to realize that dream. Uh, it's not yet clear whether there will be a win-win uh, for the my company, for the community uh, and for Semex and but we're continuing to actively work on it. Um, we, we have a, a presence in Bonny Dune and we've also leased a significant amount of space at the airport and marina uh, near Monterey. Uh, but we, we still have a, a dream of, of being able to one day bring a plan uh, before you and before the community that everybody can be really excited about and support uh, for having our, our corporate headquarters located in Bonny Dune. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, my name is Colin Hannon. I'm a resident of Newtown, along with my wife and my two kids who attend the school. Uh, Pacific School, and uh, I have very little to say. I just wanted to um, voice my support for what the DNCA has has um, put forward in their their most recent letter, um, and just reiterate that that we're all concerned for all my neighbors and everyone I've spoken to in, uh, uh, in town is concerned about the size of, of these plans. Um, so, uh, as everyone has, I just support what what the folks on the DNCA have said, and hope that you will um, consider all of that um, carefully as you consider, continue to move forward with this very complicated process, which uh, um, I know m takes a huge amount of uh, work and thought to go into it. Um, but we just hope that that it won't ruin what is there because it's so so beautiful and and, and wonderful, and, and we want to keep it something like that instead of having it be overrun kind of. Um, and I, another thing that, that I think the integration of, of all these plans would be a good idea um, and something that I mean, we're all concerned about already is, is the impacts that are already happening with, with tourism and um, without any kind of supervision or, or enough, ra no rangers or anything like that. I mean, there's none of that is there and it seems like that could be a part of what's going to happen um, in these plans, but um, it just, it's worrisome that it's already, the traffic is dangerous. Um, there, there's trash that all of us go out and pick out huge bags of trash and stuff. Um, there, there's a lot of impact already and, and this seems like it could impact it more if it's not done carefully. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of Aptos, but I've taken an interest in this project um, because I, I think it's a very beautiful area, but also because of my uh, interest in the plan to close the Warranella uh, private at-grade railroad crossing, which is the safest ingress egress for the new town area and would certainly serve uh, what is being discussed here today. That is a plan for closure by the county in order to grant a new new crossing for the Aptos Village developers. So that's why I've attended these community meetings. I would like to urge you to keep that crossing open. The uh, residents of Newtown have been very strong in their opposition Becky, to closing it. you need to be it. speaking about the item before us and that is not on the, today's agenda. It is part of the service for the traffic and the mitigations that could come from this. So I'm going to continue. I am concerned about the uh, possible water impacts of this and so I hope that is very well considered in any um, EIR work that is done as the traffic safety and the Warrenella crossing. And um, I ask that uh, rail passenger service be included in any uh, examination in an EIR. I understand in reading the documentation, I'm sorry I was not able to be here for the presentation, but in reading the documentation, um, the, ca the process would be stalled until the county could find the money to do the EIR, and correct me if I'm wrong, but to me this seems backwards. 
that uh, the county is willing to take on the heavy financial burden of an environmental impact report that should be the, shouldered sorry, by CEMEX. In the, in the presentation, it was clear that we don't have, we aren't gonna fund it and we're gonna be seeking outside funding for it. The, the county will or the CEMEX property owners will? Whoever, whoever wants to pay for it can step forward and pay for it, but the county will be seeking outside funding. It was in the presentation. All right, well, thank you. I understood that in the documentation too, but I do not feel it's proper that public monies be used for this. I think it should be paid for by the property owner, as should be all mitigations and hazardous materials cleanup. That's my comment, thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Okay, that closes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for consideration. Uh, uh, just a couple brief statements. Um, one is the big picture, as was noted, the North Coast um, is, uh, has been sort of discovered uh, and is feeling tremendous impacts uh, from growth and um, a number of projects which uh, by themselves are all exciting, um, but w w could cause more impacts to Davenport of the San Vicente Redwoods, North Coast Rail Trail, uh, the Chitoni Coast Dairies National Monument. Um, and, you know, uh, it's correct that, that there is um, a lack of infrastructure to deal with um, the influx of people. One of the challenges or one of the reasons we went forward with this plan was because uh, this is the, this property and the potential resources that come with it are the, are the way to address some of those and that to have this uh, plant sit uh, fenced up and rusting for the next uh, two generations will both be a lost opportunity as well as a, a real um, limitation on the infrastructure to, to reduce the impacts uh, of this community, uh, on this community. And so in order for it to be, uh, to be reused, it needed to, to be economically viable. In order for it to be economically viable, it needs to have, the project needs to be of some significance. Um, when you look at the four components of the proposed alternatives, uh, there is um, the uh, visitor serving aspect, which, um, uh, I think the is really dri driven by the Coastal Commission and the Coastal Commission actually wants more than what is proposed in um, scenario five, but since the final approval of anything that goes here will take Coastal Commission approval, that visitor serving will need to be an, a, a significant component to any project uh, brought forward. The second part is the flexible work live space, uh, or not work live space, but flexible R&D space. That R&D space um, was a really important component for the community in terms of transitioning uh, this property from a old uh, economy to a new economy um, in terms of providing jobs and opportunities and uh, vitality uh, to the community. The third piece is the housing. 60 units are for employee housing, so to reduce those units would be to reduce would be to reduce employee housing and also increase traffic because you'd still have the same number of people working there, they just wouldn't be living on site. Uh, and so uh, that could have a negative impact on the adjacent community. And then the 20 units um, were added to try to make this uh, project uh, uh, economically feasible. The last component is the community benefits and whether it's a parking lot uh, to access the various um, new properties that are opening up, uh, restrooms, the various things that the North Coast is really uh, feeling uh, is uh, an important component but it only happens if the redevelopment happens. And so trying to balance all those different components into a plan um, to then look at whether there's the av available water, whether there's available sewer, whether there's available, tra what the traffic impacts would be, what the various other impacts would be, um, is where we landed on um, this alternative five. And so um, this is far from a final plan, it's far from a perfect plan, uh, but as I've said before, it's the beginning of the beginning. Um, and um, hopefully we have um, somebody come forward with a project 
at some point, and we have uh, a lot more opportunities for members of the public to talk about what they want and how they maintain the character of their community while also balancing this opportunity. Finally, I'd be negligent not to point out that um, over the last couple years, this community of Davenport um, has borne some of the highest water and sewer rates in the country. Uh, we've been able to uh, attract tens of millions of dollars in grants uh, to offset those costs. Um, that the designation that allows the county to go get those grants is going away in 2020. Um, so the residents of Davenport uh, by themselves without, without something on this site will be looking at um, significant costs going forward to maintain their sewer and water system that the county is unable to um, uh, legally uh, backfill. And if there's a disaster, potentially tens of thousands of dollars per household uh, if, uh, if the water or sewer system needs to be replaced, and that finding a use for this could be a tremendous benefit to reduce some of that burden on the community, and that's just a, that's just a reality going forward um, that, that makes uh, redevelopment of the site uh, and a, a potentially important uh, benefit to the community. Um, so with that, I'll ask uh, if any of my uh, colleagues have any um, comments or questions. Seeing none, uh, I'd entertain a motion. Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I know that a lot of study has gone into this or, or review of this, and I think your, your explanation of the four components and of course the basis of, uh, for whatever that decision may be if, and what the EIR will, will show what is needed or what's, what's uh, sh if there are shortages, I think that we, uh, it's proper to move ahead. I'm, it's interesting to hear that Joby, Joby Aviation is still may have some interest in this property and, and doing something there. But um, I would move to uh, uh, approve alternate five. And uh, I do not know that, I mean, just because that's what it says right now today, it doesn't mean what it's going to be. We have a long way to go still, but I would make a motion to approve alternate five. Thank you, so you're m moving to approve the staff recommended actions, and that includes the, the items that uh, Mr. Constable read into the agenda from the Coast Commission, right. et cetera. I'll second the staff recommendations. All right, so we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, that passes four to zero, and thank you everybody for coming out today. Um, we're now moving on to uh, item number nine, uh, which is to consider a final appointment of Carmen Herrera Mansier uh, to the Workforce Development Board for a term to expire June 30th, 2022. I'll move to approve. Second. Mo motion by uh, Caput, second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes four to zero. Item number 10, which is considered a final appointment of Ferris Sabah to the first five commission as, as an at-large representative for a term to expire April 1st, 2021. I'll move to approve. All right, a motion by Caput, second by McPherson. Uh, any uh, discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed, that passes four to zero. We're now gonna move into a uh, closed session, uh, and I'm gonna ask uh, the county council if there's gonna be any reportable action. No. All right, thank you very much, uh, and uh, we'll be moving into the closed session, thank you.